Welcome to worship at Grace United Church. Today we mark Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled the people and the modern church was born. But I have to say that the folks at Grace United seem to be spirit-filled every day, too. May your spirit be lifted by participating in this online worship. We're glad you're here, no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, knowing that we are all united in God's love, gifted with grace, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Today, the Reverend Phyllis Reed is joining us. Many thanks to Phyllis and to all those who have contributed to this worship experience. You will also be invited to participate in a Zoom discussion of the sermon Sunday at 1130 with a virtual fellowship time after that. If you miss seeing familiar faces, we encourage you to participate. Your spirits will be lifted. Join us. Good morning. Join me in the call to worship. In his gospel, John reports that Jesus told us that we will never be alone. An advocate will share our journey. The Holy Spirit is with us. In these days when we have to leave our buildings and worship in new ways, the Spirit has given us the gifts we need to find new ways. So as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, let us be reminded that just as the original disciples were not sure what to do next, we also have been given the guide and we are not alone. Amen. God, giver of the Spirit, we sit surrounded by red and hear the amazing story of Pentecost this morning, but we've heard it so many times before. It is so familiar, we've ceased to be amazed and surprised or filled with excitement. Forgive us for our complacency. Blow us out of our complacency. Let the flames of passion dance in our lives. Inspire us with visions and dreams. Help us appreciate each gift you give us. Help us be truly Pentecost people. God has promised to send us the Spirit that we might fully know God's presence in the world and in our lives. Know that the Spirit of forgiveness and understanding flows over us this day and always. Happy Pentecost. The scripture reading today is from Job verses 20 to 22. See, God will not reject a blameless person, nor take the hand of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked will be no more. In today's Gospel reading, Matthew presents Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, 
sent by God to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Here is Matthew 19, verses 23 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Here ends the reading. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit as the fire and burn. Come as the rain and cleanse. Come as the wind and disturb. Convict, convert, consecrate us, O God, until we are wholly thine. Amen. What's so funny, young lady? What's so funny, young man? Wipe that smile off your face. At your age, grow up, get serious. You must never laugh at school. You must never laugh at work. You must never laugh in church. Being dignified is what matters most. Did you grow up hearing messages from all sides like that that discouraged play and laughter? I suspect you're not alone if you remember hearing comments like these. It's possible we're still giving these messages to ourselves and to others. But when we do, what if we're missing out on some of the fullness of life that God intends for us? Biblical scholars have suggested that if we read the Bible assuming there's no humor in it, we may be missing the point of certain passages. Elton Trueblood, who wrote a book called The Humor of Christ, says it was his four-year-old daughter who inspired him to study the topic. They were having a family Bible reading, and the passage was from Matthew chapter 7. He was reading along, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? When all of a sudden the four-year-old laughed out loud. He said, oh yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Then he began discovering other places where Jesus used humor or exaggeration to make a point. Just in the book of Matthew, there's also Matthew 23, 24, where Jesus is denouncing the scribes and Pharisees and says, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. And of course, there's our gospel lesson for today with the memorable image of a camel trying to get through the eye of a needle. In recent years, someone actually did a study proving that things learned with humor are remembered longer. Maybe Jesus understood that all those years ago without needing a study to prove it to him. If he had simply said, Pay more attention to your own shortcomings and less to your neighbors. Or don't focus on trivial things and ignore what's most important. Or some people may let their wealth get in the way of their relationship with God. Would it have made as much of an impact on his hearers? Possibly because of messages they were given as children, some people have a hard time considering the idea that Jesus used humor. I read someone's theory that maybe there was a gate into the city that was so small it was called the needle's eye, and camels couldn't get through it. 
it couldn't be that Jesus was exaggerating to make a point. A writer named Cal Samra tells about a priest showing a drawing of Jesus called the Laughing Christ to an adult education class. One rather grim-faced individual asked, where in, the, where in the Bible does it ever say that Jesus laughed? The priest's response was that Jesus was a real human being who started out as a baby and presumably like all babies, he wet his diapers on occasion. Where in the Bible does it say he ever wet his diapers? The grim individual walked out in a huff. As a matter of fact, at the end of the Gospel of John, we read in chapter 21, verse 25, but there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Mr. Samra suggests that if gospel writers do not record things like, quote, the twinkle in Jesus' eye, the gentle smile, the grin, the hearty laugh, that doesn't necessarily mean they weren't there, end of quote. It isn't only in the gospels that we find references to joy, gladness, and humor. An Old Testament example of humor at least somebody's idea of humor, which reminds me of the old take my wife please jokes, is in Proverbs 21.9. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than inside a house shared with a contentious wife. That might go for contentious husbands as well. What is especially notable is that throughout the Bible, we find passages indicating that joy, laughter, and even foolishness are gifts from God or signs of a relationship with God. There's today's Old Testament scripture from Job saying, God will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. And in the Psalms, we find Psalm 16, where the psalmist is addressing God saying, you show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In Psalm 126, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Those are just a few of many examples. Is it not appropriate then for those of us who call ourselves Christians to recognize that God can come to us in deep joy and hearty laughter? If we closed our minds to those possibilities, could we be missing out on important ways to enhance our spiritual growth? Of course, there is much that passes for humor in our world that does not bring joy. In the Christian community, we can help each other sort out what is life enhancing and what is not. Wouldn't it be a shame to close ourselves off to wonderful surprises in our concern to avoid anything that could have a negative side? We might consider humor as a valuable gift God has given us that is best handled carefully. In his book, The Healing Power of Humor, Alan Klein suggests humor can be treated like a prescription medicine. Even though it could be like poison if misused, when used with care, it has great healing benefits. We all know what those destructive things masquerading as humor are like. Put downs, ridicule, sarcasm, etc etc especially these days many things are called jokes or humor that are clearly not life enhancing some of us wonder how some of the so-called comedians can get any more dehumanizing and then they do 
if we recognize unhealthiness for what it is and say so, we may be told, lighten up, as though the problem is with those who see clearly. Lighten up seems to say, if you don't think this junk is funny, then you have no sense of humor. But there are so many ways humor does bring joy. Many options for those who value building up rather than tearing down. In addition to the insights we get by reading scripture with new eyes, there are the insights we get from contemporary forms of humor that might hit home a little bit. Awareness can come with a chuckle and awareness can lead to change. A cartoon shows eight people in what looks like a typical church meeting room, except that the room and the people in it are completely disheveled. Chairs turned over, lamps broken, people bruised and battered. One individual who is still standing says, then it's settled. We paint the Sunday school room green. A writer in the Christian Century magazine in the past used the name Saint Hereticus and decided we need some really honest hymns. Here's one that makes me squirm. Oh God, I'm really not a cad. The things I do are not so bad. My actions on the whole are right. I'll praise to thee, my God, this night. My tiny sins thou canst pass by, the spiteful word, the little lie. And then I can give thanks aright for all the blessings of the light. My peccadillos are so few compared to what my neighbors do. From their misdeeds, such frightful things. Keep me, oh, keep me, king of kings. And since they much more need thine aid than I, thy servant undismayed, please concentrate on bigger things beneath thine own almighty wings. What do you think? Can we learn from humor? I think this gift God gives us can help us grow in understanding. It can also help us cope with difficult situations. When I was interim pastor at Parma Greece UCC, I called on an elderly couple who both had macular degeneration and both were losing their eyesight. They belonged to a support group for that ailment, and what they always talked about was how much fun they had in the group and how they laughed and laughed together. A lot of strength can come from a group like that. The fact is, more and more scientific studies show that laughter brings measurable benefits to health. You may be familiar with these from many articles and books. One of the most well-known writers on the subject was Norman Cousins, who famously used laughter to heal from what had been diagnosed as a terminal illness. Laughter can even be the catalyst that makes it possible for tears to flow in a situation where the pain goes so deep that a person is unable to cry. Have you ever known a time when you were laughing and crying at the same time? Not the kind of thing where there's an attempt to bury feelings with superficial joking, which tends to prolong the suffering, but the humor that genuinely gives release, that maybe provides a little vacation from pain in order to gather up energy for facing what must be faced. A woman in tornado country came crawling up out of what used to be her basement in what used to be her house and said to her neighbor, I was really dreading packing up the new move next month. Now I won't have to pack a thing. I believe humor is life enhancing if we but use it. 
After all, it fits life so well. Think of the kinds of things that make us laugh. Isn't it usually that something is going along in one direction, we think we know what's coming, and all of a sudden there's a switch to the unexpected. We're surprised and we laugh. And isn't life a lot like that? We're going along, living our lives, and all of a sudden we're in the middle of a pandemic. And humor is what is helping a lot of us get through it. In closing, I, live, I leave you with three quotes to ponder. From Leslie Weatherhead. The opposite of joy is not sorrow. It is unbelief. From Elton Trueblood. It is not really surprising that the Christian should laugh and sing. After all, we have a great deal to laugh about. We understand that though there is an ocean of darkness and death, there is, an, there is also an ocean of light and love which flows over the darkness. And finally, from Martin Luther, your laughter is the measure of your faith. Amen. As we go to prayer with Reverend Reed, please keep the following people in your prayers. Dave, a friend of Beth and Bob, a Red Cross worker whose rheumatoid arthritis is causing heart problems. For Claudia, whose son Matthew died unexpectedly, he was only in his 40s. For Stephanie, who's recovering from surgery. For Patty, who is in rehabilitation at Cuba Hospital. Elwin and Elsie Gear, thank everyone for their prayers for Olivia and her family. Alfred Sr. is still recovering from COVID-19. We also pray for Mary's nephew, Jason, who has a mild case of COVID. And we pray for the family of Wayne Hall, who died this week. We also pray for all those living with mental health issues and those who are addicted. We pray for all the frontline workers in the medical field who are bravely caring for so many sick people, for first responders who go to work each day facing the unknown, and for the last responders who pick up those who have fought the good fight and finished the race. We pray for all who are grieving Pray for those in long-term care facilities and their families who are kept from them. Remember, especially Gert and Lois and Amy and Karen. We pray for those dealing with cancer, including Glenn, Shermaine, Gary, Harvey, 
Mike, Amy, Patricia, Connie, Bill, Jerry, Sherry, Don, Michelle, Bob, Kathy, Amy, Dwight, and Susan. Let us bow together. Oh God, you are the beginning and the end. You set the stars in their places and fill the earth with its fullness. We come to you in prayer. We see only our moment of time, but you behold the end from the beginning. We know only our little circles of friends and acquaintances, but you number all humanity as your children. Teach us that you are still our guide. Remind us that the vastness of the world has not pushed us out of your sight, nor the multitude of people blotted us out from your vision. Teach us that you are in our hearts and in our minds, closer to us than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Teach us that as you are the God of history, so too you rule over every moment, including this one. Today, loving God, we ask that you hear the prayers we have said aloud and those that are in our hearts that we dare not speak aloud. We know that you hear and will respond. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who began time anew and made us new creatures, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, this is the feast of God's people. At this table are welcome people of all races and nationalities, all denominations and ages, all people who earnestly desire peace with their neighbors, all who seek God's mercy. Let us pray. Bless now, O oh God, by your word and spirit, both us and these gifts of bread and cup, that in receiving them at this table and in offering here our faith and praise, we may be united with Christ and one another and remain faithful to the tasks before us. In strength Christ gives, we offer ourselves to you giving thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. 
Friends, it is because of an event that occurred in the upper room many hundreds of years ago, and as a memorial of this same Jesus, that we share in a manner not unlike their sharing. For our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat our Lord's body broken for you, that you might know the forgiveness Jesus' sacrifice offers. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink of it, all of you, the blood of Christ shed for you, that you might participate in the new life Christ gives. Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus the Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we go courageously into our hurting world with arms that embrace, with lips that speak God's liberating truth, with hearts that capture enemies by the strength of love. We are bearers of God's image, receivers of God's grace, channels of God's peace, stewards of God's gifts. Let us go into the world wearing our face masks and remembering who we are. Amen. <laughs>